Walt Disney. He saved Disneyland by using access to the cash values out of his insurance policy. JC Penney did it. Ray Kroc at McDonald's did it. David Walker is the comptroller of the. And he said, I'll tell you where to put your money in max funded universal life. Wow. We came so close to a financial collapse in 2008, and he said to America, this is where I put my money. Don't follow the herd putting money in IRAs of 401ks, and don't listen to the mainstream media, because they're part of the herd. And people uh, get hung up on what it is instead of what it does. Ooh, key point. It's not costing, it's making you money. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. So if my guest today looks familiar, you're correct. It is Douglas Andrew, New York Times bestselling author, financial expert, and financial strategist here back on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel, fresh from a keynote talk here at our conference here at Louisville, Kentucky called The Greatest Event. Doug, pleasure to have you here again and now live and in person versus Zoom. Oh yeah, awesome. It's an honor always to be with you, Matt. Awesome, Doug. You know, one of the conversations we've had uh, many times is just the difference of insurance. Because everybody thinks that you know life insurance is only for one reason. It's because it's to bury you to pay for those expenses. But what I want to talk about is really the nuances of different strategies when it comes to life insurance. Because oftentimes people run into the time-tested, by-term, and invested difference argument. And I mm. think the number one cha- the number one video on your channel is what again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's why, what I call it, uh, by term invest the difference on steroids, Correct. but I have a son-in-law that posted a video that's uh, pretty popular about uh, challenging the Dave Ramsey approach. Gotcha. Yeah. So look, when, we, when we unpack that uh, in this conversation, so oftentimes people come into the conversation and, hey, you know, life insurance should never be an investment. Life insurance should be separated from your your 401k, all those different things. What would you say to those folks who are having that type of discussion with their financial professionals? Yeah, because unfortunately, um, in the financial services industry, Matt, and uh, I've been around a long time. Um, just a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just about 47 years now. And, it, and it's interesting because the financial services industry, because of whatever, um, they say, well, you can't call insurance an investment. Mm-hmm. I go, well, that's okay with me. Because apparently investments, uh, can, uh, you can experience losses. And that's uh, unacceptable to me. So, so I'm glad it's not called an investment. Uh, apparently investments sooner or later are taxed. So I don't want one of those. What I want is a vehicle that is far superior. So many times I'll say, <clears throat> well, what would you call something? that you put money into. It's not an investment, but you put money into this thing. and It's it's an incredible vehicle. And it it accumulates tax-free at really good rates of return. Not pie in the sky, but average rates of return of 7 to 10%, which is the equivalent of getting 15% or more in a tax-deferred IRA or 401k. And uh, when the market goes up, when the economy is up, you get to participate. But when the market goes down, you don't lose (laughs) because your money is not at risk in the market. So you can earn average rates of return of seven to 10%. If you know rule of 72, you divide your your interest rate into 72 and it tells you how fast your money doubles. So your money is going to double every seven to 10 years. So if you put in, let's say $500,000, I don't care if it's 500 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month will grow to over a million bucks in 30 years with those kinds of rates of return. But uh, older people, a half a million, okay, they, it doubles to a million every seven to 10 years. That million doubles to two million and another, and, and two million doubles to four million, four million doubles to eight million. We actually have clients who started out with just 500,000. Now that's a lot of money, but they spent quite a while accumulating that. They now have $8 million generating uh, 600,000 to 800,000 a year tax free if they live to be 120. So here is this uh, instrument, financial vehicle. You put money into it, accumulate your money tax-free. It allows you to access money tax-free and not outlive your money if you live to be 120. And when you die, whatever's left in there blossoms and increases in value and transfers income tax-free. Now, whenever I ask audiences that question, what would you call something that does that? Predictably, it's usually people on the front row yell out, a miracle!
miracle <laughs> <laughs> a godsend in this topsy-turvy world of unpredictability that we're in I go yep uh, but you don't call it an investment it's way better than one of those and they go golly I've never heard of this before how does it work yeah it works really well for all kinds of financial goals and so that's why I often re uh, compare it to uh, like a financial Swiss army knife you can use it for retirement and college funding and emergency funds and working capital for business uh, real estate equity management as you know sure. uh, and uh, estate planning I mean you can use it for so many purposes because it's the dream solution when you understand how to structure it correctly and fund it properly Doug that's insurance it, it, people think that goodness gracious that's not investment that's insurance so Doug the stereotypes as well the only people that really make money with life insurance are people that are commissioned to make money selling it you know so but the flip side to that is well you don't think that people at the fund manager don't charge you a fee the worst worst about that is they charge you a fee not only in the good times but also in the bad times so when you're losing money they're still charging you a fee how would you respond to those thank those you comments? for asking that question because you know a lot of times critics will talk about oh the fees insurance uh, uh, you have uh, maybe a, a front-loaded commission or something and I'll go okay let's use a comparison here if somebody came to me and it, it doesn't matter if they're gonna sock away 500 bucks a month or whether uh, a lot of our clients are already you know 55 60 years old and, and now they maybe painted themselves into a tax trap is what we call it and uh, they're not in a lower tax bracket in fact I don't think people who accumulate very much of a respectable retirement nest egg are, are in lower tax brackets when they retire. Now, so they start pulling money out of their traditional IRAs or 401ks and they're getting taxed to death and they pay back every two and a half or three years. 100% uh, of the tax they saved over 30 years on the contributions. And they're thinking, whose retirement uh, was I planning anyway? Mine or Uncle Sam's. <laughs> so <clears throat> the critics who say, well, you are selling an insurance policy that has a, a, a front end load. Well, if I had a client putting in 500,000, my compensation might be, let's say $20,000, but it's usually paid for out of a minuscule portion of money that would otherwise have gone out the window in unnecessary income tax. I got a commission on the front money that went in. I never made a dime off of what my clients cash grew by year by year by year so uh, asset managers they usually charge let's say one percent or more mm -hmm. on the asset management and they'll keep making that if you put a half a million dollars with an asset manager and if it was earning as good of a rate of return as my index universal life has between seven to ten percent average uh, by the time you retired let's say 30 years down the road you know what an asset manager would have charged you in fees just barely under one million dollars <laughs> now let me use the metaphor so <clears throat> if I went to um, uh, as a realtor let's say to to uh, sell or buy help you find a home to buy mm -hmm. and I said listen I can find you a really good home and uh, you have a choice you can pay me a one-time fee of 20,000 or even 30,000 let's say mm -hmm. on a half million dollar home that'd be 30,000 six percent is a normal realtor's fee right okay so <clears throat> you can either pay me one time 30,000 or this is really what I want you to do uh, <clears throat> I want to charge you one percent on the price of that home the value of that home as it goes up in value every year for the next 30 years Wh which one do you want <laughs> <laughs> and anybody with any smarts goes, uh, I'll do the one time and let my house appreciate and go from 500,000 to a million to two million to four million to eight million. I mean, hello. So it's probably one of the most inexpensive financial plans ever. You don't choose investments based upon um, which ones grow to the most or cost the least at the outset. You choose investments based upon which ones will generate the most at the time in life you're going to be using the money the most down the road. And a maximum funded indexed universal life is the cheapest product at the end of the day of any financial instrument that does what it does. Look, you've been doing this, as you said, 47 years old. And it's shocking. Yeah. You told me backstage you're 
Oh, I'm going to be 69. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I told you my first watch was a sundial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you look great. So, Doug, when you're looking at strategies that was really became very popular in the 70s and 80s, which was buy term yep. and invest the difference, which still today is still an ongoing argument with all the information education still out there, still arguing that this financial concept is still a solvent strategy. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there are just unaware of the other side. So what would you say to those critics of the buy term and invest the different? I ended up uh, being responsible for over 3,000 clients in 13 Western states. And, you know, we were trying to do a good job uh, selling them term insurance and putting the difference into uh, mutual funds. And, and it was a sort of like a forced investment because a lot of people don't even invest the difference. Okay. Spend it, yeah. And the whole theory was, uh, if you listen to the Dave Ramseys and the Susie Ormans, well, when you accumulate uh, enough, uh, at the end of the day, you won't need insurance anymore when it gets expensive. Mm -hmm. When Universal Life came out in 1980, E.F. Hutton was the brainchild of that, okay? They weren't in an insurance company. And they were the ones who said, wait a minute, <clears throat> we're out here. Did you ever play red light, green light when you were a kid? Sure. Okay. So <clears throat> the stock market, we had money in, uh, in, in mutual funds. And it was like playing red light, green light. So there were some periods where you might uh, take 20 steps forward. You get 20% return, but then the next year you have to take, you know, 10 or 15 steps back, up and back, up and back. The stock market is like a person with a yo-yo, maybe hopefully walking up some stairs, let's say. Well, when Hutton realized the average rate of return, even if you earned 12%, let's say you finally accumulate a million dollars in a retirement nest egg and you're only 12%. That's 120 grand a year. You pull out 120,000, uh, you're taking 12 steps forward, you're taking four steps back in tax, between federal and state tax. You take another step back in fees because they're charging 1% on that million. You're netting seven, even though you're grossing 12. Do you know what most people actually earn with their money in the market? Because they get invo involved in emotion. They, <clears throat> they watch like in 2001 to 2003, they watch the market go down, 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 down. And they, they finally say enough already and they sell. They sell low. And then they wait, 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 and they buy high. So Dalbar, who studies investor behavior, says the average, especially retiree, only is earning 3.5%. This is what precipitated the 4% rule in the financial services industry. So they're not earning 12 you got a million bucks, you pull out 4%, uh, that's 40 grand. You pay tax in a 25% bracket of 10,000. Now you're netting 30. Now, what, what about the 1% fee on that? That's another 10 grand. You, you're living off of 2% or 3%. I don't know if you're like me, but I don't accumulate a million bucks to have a measly 20 or 30,000 net to buy gas, groceries, prescriptions, and golf green fees. That's pretty pathetic. With my index universal life, I was able to uh, participate in the market without the risk. When the market went up, I'm able to earn. When it goes down, I don't lose because of indexing. So in answer to your question, mm -hmm. <clears throat> by having my money there, I'm able to earn average returns. Uh, conservatively, I've earned 8.2% net cash on cash. So a million dollar nest egg can generate 80,000 a year of tax-free income. Whereas most IRAs and 401ks, you're going to be lucky in the market to net, uh, to, to earn four and net three or two because of the taxes. And so <clears throat> when Hutton came out with it, I went, this is buy term, invest the difference on steroids. People don't invest the difference. If I maximum fund it, my cash value pretty soon uh, equals the death benefit and pushes it ahead. So the cost of the insurance hear this, gets cheaper as you get older. <laughs> and people go, what? I've never seen an insurance policy that gets cheaper as I get older. Well, you haven't seen one done correctly then. Because my universal life policies that are 30 years old cost less than 1 20th what they did when I was 30 years younger. Because cost of insurance per thousand goes up, but the amount of insurance that's at risk with the insurance company is going down. If I earn 10% this year, I would net 10 point, I, I, would, earn, I would net 9.9 .9 because mm -hmm. the cost of the insurance has gotten cheaper as I've gotten older because I'm self-insuring. Yep. So this whole argument of Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, oh, 20, 30 years from now, you won't, um, you won't need the term insurance when it gets expensive because you'll have the money. Well, Universal Life, you have the money Sometimes as soon as 15 years, 
and you're self-insured. I'm using it for living benefits and when I die it will blossom and transfer tax-free but when uh, Hutton came out with that, oh, let's take the least amount of insurance we can get away with in the Internal Revenue Code and put in the most money. And pretty soon you are self-insuring in as little as 15 years. You put in 500,000, the minimum death benefit for a 60 year old is a million two fifty. Your 500,000 is going to exceed a million two fifty in less than 15 years at the growth. So it's like, and now <clears throat> when the cash value grows to 2 million, the death benefit stays ahead by 5%. The insurance company is only charging you for the remaining amount, 100,000 at risk. This thing is a tax-free cash cow. And people uh, get hung up on what it is instead of what it does. Ooh, key point. But Doug, you know, <clears throat> the big misconception, people say, oh, well, term insurance is only 50 bucks. Why is my eviction versus life premium so expensive at 500 bucks? Because people don't think that, you know, the annual renewable term inside the, the, the $500 premium, it's not all going to life insurance. And oh. can, can, you, can, you, can you unpack that further? Yes, because <clears throat> before universal life came about, there was term and whole life. Whole life insurance allowed you to pay a higher premium to where you were um, overpaying the early years. And then later on at age 45, 50, you were starting to underpay. Uh, so you could be covered for your whole life. Now, whole life is okay for death benefit. When they developed universal life, it was primarily for living benefits. So even though you put in $500, people that would come to me wanted to increase the liquidity on their money that was earmarked for retirement, for college funding for their kids and so forth. Uh, they wanted to increase the safety, not only of where their money is, the institution, but safety of principle. So when, when the market went down, they didn't lose and they wanted to have a nice rate of return that historically has beaten inflation. You can't be rowing upstream at the rate of one mile an hour in a bank and the current of inflation is coming down to three or four. You're going backwards. And so <clears throat> people would say, Doug, where can I put my money that's earmarked for retirement, uh, my kids' college education, emergency funds, and I'm going, well, let me show you this Swiss Army knife, okay? Now, you put your money in here and you go, wait a minute, that's $500 a month. Well, how much are you putting in the company's 401k? What if I could show you this will knock the socks off of that? What about this money you have sitting in the bank earning a measly 1%? If you could increase the safety and the rate of return up to 5%, how much more is five than one? It's five times. And all of a sudden they go, yeah, it makes sense. And then I would create an illustration. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, here we go. The first few years they may look at it and go, well, uh, there's some fees in there. Look at what it does at the back end. And so I'd show them the back end at age 60 or 65. And then we start taking out income. And I would compare to their 401k and it would crash and burn in 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, money and, and municipal bonds would crash and burn. Mutual funds, even if we anticipated 12%, because they're taxable. All of these are running out of money. And I go, look at this one over on the far right. Uh, it, it, it will last if you live to be 120 and you still have your million bucks or whatever. And they'd go, whoa, and I'd say, which one would you like? Uh, the one on the right, duh. And then I would say, um, <clears throat> well, do you know what that is? And they'd say, what is that? I said, it's a life insurance policy. <laughs> and sometimes they'd go, <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, I don't need insurance. I go, really? Okay, look at what it does. Which one knocks the others completely, blows it out of the water? Well, the one on the right, but we don't need insurance. I don't want to pay for insurance. I'm going, who's paying? It's, it's not costing. It's making you money. Um, okay, if you don't really want the insurance, make me the beneficiary then. <laughs> but, but choose the one that's going to accumulate your money the best, tax-free, and, and generate the most income. And when you die, it, it blossoms and transfers. And finally, they would get it and say, oh, you mean that's net? I'm going, yeah, that's the net. Everything that you're looking at there is after the cost of the insurance, which is now this. Over the life of it, if you, if you earn nine, you'll net eight. If you earn seven, you'll net six. If you earn 11, you'll, you'll net 10. I've been doing that for 45 years. And people go, wow, how come I've never heard of this before? Well, uh, I've heard, heard of it for 45 years, but don't follow the herd, putting money in IRAs of 401ks. Best advice I've ever heard, don't follow the herd and don't listen to the mainstream media because they're part of the herd. 
you need to break away and um, take ownership of a brighter future by learning uh, the merits of a max funded indexed universal life. It's funny you just mentioned that just last week we just interviewed a former Super Bowl champion. His name is Brendan Ayem Badejo. In Brooklyn from Nigeria, grew up in Chicago, got drafted, mm. I think, by, uh, no, no, he made the team as an undrafted player, got traded to the Chicago Bears. That's where I, we got to know him as a fan. Wow. Make a long story short, he gets out of league, wins the Super Bowl with the Ravens. But at 25, 26 years old, starts funding a bunch of policies. Mm. And he leaves the league and he says, the banks wouldn't give me uh, money, but I took money from my, my, my life insurance policies yeah. to fund my Orange Theory gyms. And I made more money in my, or, my 50 Orange Theory gyms than my entire playing career because it was funded by... Oh, yeah. The, I love Orange Theory. Have you ever... Oh, so, yeah. 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 These soccer moms are pretty, they're, they're like pretty competitive. I was trying to keep but, up with But it's Orange true. <laughs> that, it, the smart people, I, I did a YouTube recently, uh, why uh, multimillionaires, wealthy people are buying more life insurance than ever. They have the money. Yeah. It's because they want their money in an instrument that will accumulate tax-free. They can access, access it tax-free. When they die, it blossoms and transfers tax-free. Nothing else does that. Yeah. Uh, and often we've referred to you know, Walt Disney. He saved Disneyland uh, by using access cash-free uh, to the cash values out of his insurance policy. J.C. Penney did it. Ray Kroc uh, McDonald's did it. Uh, David uh, Walker is the comptroller of the, of the um, uh, General Accountability Office. For when he left the Obama yeah. administration, he said, I'll tell you where to put your money in max funded universal life. Wow. Because he saw how critical the country was. We came so close to a financial collapse yep. in 2008, and he said to America, this is where I put my money. Why is that? Is it because of the reserves, the, the promise to pay the reserves, behind the reserves? You know, the, the whole conversation too, because you know, in the collapse, not one A-rated insurance company failed. You find out these real estate companies failed, banks failed, mortgage companies failed. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand that uh, the insurance industry, legal reserve insurance industry, is not only the backbone of America, but the backbone of the world. This is, <clears throat> again, if you were to look at uh, banks, in 2008, 400 banks went under, 900 more were on the brink on the watch list, mm -hmm. and not one legal reserve insurance company went under. If they had a little bit of a, a, a run on the bank thing like AIG did because of the mortgages and so forth, it was, uh, they were able to, uh, they couldn't call all their mortgages due instantly. But there's always in the um, legal reserve insurance industry, uh, you cross insure, which is way better than an FDIC. FDIC technically went broke when they bailed out the savings and loans. So <clears throat> one insurance company uh, not only manages billions, one I'm thinking about uh, manages about three trillion. That's as much money as the IRS collects in taxes in an entire year. One insurance company, and they manage that much money maybe with one skyscraper full of employees. You know how many federal employees uh, spend, you know, it takes to manage you know, three or four trillion that the IRS brings in. So <clears throat> this is how I look at it, Matt. When people say, why do you put your serious cash there? It's because, in my opinion, the insurance industry would be the last domino to fall if things got really bad. Okay, you'd have so much forewarning because the banks would be uh, uh, collapsing. Uh, in the Great Depression, 80%, uh, real estate dropped 80%, a lot of real estate. Banks went under, 40% never uh, reopened again. Not one legal reserve insurance company went under the Great Depression. They came through with flying colors, crediting two and a half, three, three and a half percent. So we would have so much warning if, that, if the economy is ready to collapse, that you could take out your money out of the insurance policy because it's so liquid. Uh, this is where banks put 30 to 40% of their tier one assets for liquidity and safety because they asked the five major banks in America in 2008, where do you have your money <laughs> for liquidity and safety in case of a run on your bank? Guess where they had it? 30 to 40% was in Boley, bank owned life insurance. See, it's the owner of the insurance policy that gets all the tax free accumulation of that. But let's say it got really bad and you got your money out of your insurance policy, if the American dollar became worthless, what good would it do to have your money? 
See, the last domino to fall would be the insurance industry. Uh, you can't buy, uh, live on gold and silver. You can't eat that. Mm -mm. So I choose to put my serious cash in the last domino that would fall. And if that fell, the American dollar would be worthless anyway. But you want it in a, in a, in a position of safety and liquidity so that you can convert it to gas and groceries or w food or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is there's things in life even more important than the money. But that's why so many institutions will choose to put your money in a bank into an insurance company because they're rock solid as far as their uh, liquid reserves. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah. I'll ask you a question, Doug. Right now with the you know, exposure to what's going on in the stock market, GameStop and everybody was purchasing yeah. through, Robin, you know, through the Robinhood app, Bitcoin doing its thing, so many shiny objects. If I'm a young person right now, if I'm in my 20s and 30s, the last thing, just like this Super Bowl uh, athlete we're talking about, the last thing he was thinking about was purchasing life insurance is the first thing to establish his financial home. What would you say to the person out there, the 20 or 30 year old that's watching this right now, that in spite of all the distractions and all the shiny objects they could put their money into, why should they start with insurance? Very good question. What you want, if you start chasing after the get rich quick things and so forth, and let me tell you, I've been around the block. I've seen many of them. And uh, it's okay if that's what you want to play with, but not until after you've established uh, a foundation. You want a rock solid foundation where you put your serious cash, where you know that uh, when you sock away this money, you're, you're wanting to make sure it's liquid when you need it. I've learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. It's a lot better to have access to your money and not need it than need it and not be able to get it if it's tied up in your real estate or, or something, uh, especially in a market that's going down. So you want to have the liquidity. Number two is safety. In this order, safety of principle, and the three is the rate of return. You don't need pie-in-the-sky rates of return to get wealthy. Seven to 10% average returns tax-free is incredible. It'll double your money every seven to 10 years. Once you get your financial house in order and that foundation there, you can go play all you want. And I can assure you, you might get rich on one or two, but most of them are going to fail and collapse sooner or later. The cryptocurrency, it's, it, I, I've watched it. I saw it when Bitcoin first came out, it's been pretty incredible. But at the end of the day, there's nothing backing that thing. It could collapse in 24 hours. Now, if you capitalize on it in the interim, way to go. But most people, um, they act out of emotion and then they, uh, they hang on or when it starts to go down, then they sell low and it, it's all out of emotion. I don't have to worry about it. When I, <clears throat> in 1987, October, when the market Black, crashed, Black Monday. Yep. Uh, I was out hunting and I used to have to run back to the office and field phone calls. I was as calm as could be. None of my clients were losing money. How about uh, uh, even in 2008? No, I didn't lose a dime. My clients didn't lose a dime. Uh, they may not have made very much, but the next year, the first 90 days of 2009, most of our clients locked in gains of 16%. Uh, the, the cap after a year, not losing a penny. From 2000 to 2012, many of our clients doubled or even tripled their money tax-free. Most Americans were barely getting back the original money they started with in 2000. So what happened uh, when we're recording this? We've had the pandemic. Sure. And uh, the spring of 2020, when the markets went 30%, I can sleep because none of that affects me. You want to have a foundation that is not subject to the whims of the market and all of these shiny objects out there. If you want to chase after those, do that with your discretionary dollars if you have them. Your serious cash, establish your foundation that's going to be rock solid, that's going to weather the storms and the little you know, things that go on in the economy and the world because they come and go. Sure thing, Doug. And Doug, there's a lot of people, as you have saw and witnessed here at our event today, which they love seeing you on stage and you rock the stage. What would you say to the newest person that's getting involved in the life insurance industry? They're a brand new agent, they just got licensed, or they're thinking about getting licensed here in short order. What would you tell them about how to establish your careers? You've done this now for 47 years. How would you tell them to get their business up off the ground? 
First of all, congratulations. Uh, you have no idea how much of a meaningful transformation you will create for your clients. And if you take this serious and don't listen to the naysayers and um, you begin to learn, empower yourself with knowledge, and then knowledge times experience gives you the wisdom. There's no greater payday, not financially, but when live or die, those people that you're helping to transform themselves financially, to be able to make sure that they cannot outlive their money in retirement. And that if they happen to die prematurely with what we call an untimely death, to be able to deliver a tax-free death claim and say, here, you, your financial house was in order, like I did when my brother passed away. I never hmm. dreamed he would be using the universal life policy I sold him as a death benefit. I thought we were going to ride Harley Davidsons and, <laughs> and, and go river rafting uh, into the twilight of life. Doggone it, he got to graduate before I did. <laughs> he was just 50 years old. But his sweet wife has been able to live in dignity for 25 years now because of that death benefit. But to the new agents, you will transform people's lives, not just financially. But if you are sincerely interested in your clients and you do what's best for them, it's like Zig Ziglar used to say, you help enough other people get what they want, you're going to get everything in life that you want. And uh, stick to it. I, I loved um, your interview with Tim Tebow uh, last mm -hmm. night because I've had many setbacks in my life and I've learned most from my negative experiences, but you cannot have a great comeback unless you have a setback. And so don't get discouraged. Uh, if I threw in the towel the first time I had a setback, um, I hate to think what I would be doing instead of transforming people's lives. Don't get discouraged. Hang in there, gain wisdom and knowledge and go out and change people's lives and you will be compensated financially but in way more uh, impactful uh, ways than just the money. The reward is unbelievable to help people optimize all of their assets and, and that's not just the money. Mm -hmm. uh, that's helping them to have the confidence to be healthy, uh, to not ever have to worry about the money because now they can go out and be uh, with their family. Uh, they can have health. You, you, many insurance agents never really get their arms around the, the impact that they have on people's lives. So stay with it. Don't get discouraged. Um, you, as you begin to progress, <laughs> um, as you know, Matt, and you're a great example of this, Looking back, um, I do not regret one minute being in this business. It's one of the most prestigious careers I could ever choose. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. What were you studying in college, Doug? <laughs> what was I studying in college? I was studying to become an attorney. Yeah. And this was a means to that end. And then most attorneys were like, <clears throat> Uh, if, if, if we had to do it over again, we'd rather go out and do what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> the, my last question, when, when, when you're talking about what I stumbled across this industry, selfishly, I was just looking to pay the bills. I could get involved, make a paycheck it was versus mortgages or versus this. But I really started to get into the meaning of the business. And that's what led me to your book in 2005, which is Misfortune 101. And I fly to your office in Salt Lake City. And I realized, I think at that point, I realized this is more than just life insurance. You are creating generational wealth. You're creating a legacy. Your, 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 your steps of meaningful transformation process yeah. was, was, was shocking to me. And it's also cool to see your sons, your, your, your boys, Aaron, Emran, and Scott, to see uh, us grow because you're, you're, you're actually building up the next generation. You, you talk about not equal distribution. You want equal opportunity. Right. And it's... Difficult for somebody with kids because they want their kids all to have more than they had, but you talk about equal opportunity. 
Before I let you go, can you share that one thought? What do you mean by that? Yes, uh, and as you know, I'm very passionate mm -hmm. about this. And my goal has always been to make sure that future generations can learn from the mistakes that I've made. And that's why my story is a long learning curve. Um, I want your story to be a fast power curve. Uh, and when I watched my sons and my son-in-law begin to grasp this, and I, I didn't pay them, they didn't fall into, you know, they, they actually worked for nothing for the first couple of years and they learned by osmosis and wow. so forth. I wouldn't pay them, you know, my son <laughs> edited my book and what have you. Okay. But <clears throat> it's because, do you want me to be honest or gentle, Matt? Honest. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> when I would meet with people, and they were highly successful. And uh, I would often ask a question, so how did you go from rags to riches? How did you achieve this empire? And they would begin to tell me their story about how they started out from scratch and so forth, just like I did at Kentucky Fried Chicken making a, a dollar an hour and so forth. And uh, then they were uh, super successful working their entire lifetime. And then off times, they would say, man, I have worked so hard. Um, my kids will never have to work as hard as I did. Well, okay. And so they would come back through the years, and then when they would retire, they would often come in and um, I'd say, how's it going? And they went, Doug, <clears throat> golly, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with my kids. They, they don't even know how to work. <laughs> and I would go, maybe you stole that from them. Ooh. As a parent, oft times we think we're helping our children by giving them everything. So when they said, my kids will never have to work as hard as I did, I'm going, well, wait a minute here. You just talked about that's what made a man out of you. So do you want to take away all of those opportunities, okay? And you start accumulating this money and then pretty soon you die because most, uh, most trusts and wills it's like as soon as you die, chunk, 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 and they divided it up and, and it drops in the kid's lap and some of them get this entitlement mindset. When do I get my share? Mom, dad, will you pay for it? Can I have? And that's called equal distribution. And uh, I'm gonna say something here. There's nothing more unequal than the uh, equal distribution to unequals. <laughs> Let me repeat it. There's nothing more unequal than the equal distribution to unequals. So, um, as a Christian, God does not give us equal distribution of blessings, let's say of health, to all of us, regardless of how some of us may choose to abuse our bodies. Our Creator gives us equal opportunities, not equal distribution. So when I began to help people uh, set up their, their trust and their family bank under equal opportunity, then my children, my grandchildren, they have to have some skin in the game. If they'll do this, 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 they save this much. Uh, if, if they contribute, if they come up and have some skin in the game, they sacrifice, they get good grades, uh, then uh, I might match them 50 cents on the dollar or a dollar for a dollar. But it's, it's giving them a hand up instead of a hand out. I taught this to our grandkids at grandpa's camp by giving all of the grandchildren little jars with caterpillars in them. And they watched in awe as the caterpillars made their cocoon, their chrysalis. A couple of weeks later, they're watching uh, it begin to emerge in the measure of its full creation as a monarch butterfly. And I warned them, what will they be tempted to do when they see it struggling mm. to help okay. it out? If they do, what happens to the butterfly? It dies. So grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, we don't want you to die. So when you're struggling, deem it a privilege that God is trusting you enough to give you this challenge. And don't be a clam on the bottom of the ocean just waiting around for plankton to float to you. America was built on an eagle on a flagpole, okay? That's right. I want you to respond with all your ability instead of taking the victim role. I want to give you equal opportunities and you come up with as much as you, you respond with all your ability, which is what, what the word responsibility means. 
And then grandma and grandpa will be there to make up the difference because I've always learned if you will be responsible and accountable and do everything you can, God will make up the difference. And that's equal opportunities for everyone instead of just, okay, I'll bail you out. And that's the equal distribution method. I'd rather leave behind in my family how to fish than just dumping a bunch of fish in their lap because then they'll be fed for a lifetime. Other than that, I don't have any strong feelings on this subject, okay? <laughs> so Doug finishes off a strong idea with a punchline, period, at the end. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation, this dialogue. Uh, if you're looking to purchase Doug's book, we'll put a link right here to the links to purchase his books. Uh, his books have changed my life. He's been a financial mentor of mine since 2005. None of my clients have lost any money based on these strategies and teachings since my insurance practice with these strategies have been incorporated since 2005, 2006. And um, my mother's money is in these strategies, my, my, my family's money is in strategies, my wife's money is in strategies, our children's college education money are these insurance strategies and they're not lost a dime and neither are clients exposed to that. So with that being said, guys, I hope you have some questions. If you do, drop it in the comment section below. Uh, make sure you follow his YouTube channel. We'll put the link of, of Doug's YouTube channel here at the bottom in the description link too as well. So if you've been watching this on Facebook, and you have your thoughts too as well, drop your comments in the comments. Follow-ups, drop in the comments. Questions, drop in the comments section below. That being said, guys, follow us on Facebook. Click you like for Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. On behalf of Douglas Andrew, I'm a Money Smart Guy. Until we meet again, continue to live smart. Continue to live smart and be money smart today. <laughs>